So in this podcast, we're, what we're going to do is kind of look at uh, Roman rule and kind of the relationship between Judaism and uh, the, the Romans. And so, uh, first of all, we'll talk about how uh, the uh, Jewish territory came under the control of the Romans. So in uh, 64 BC, uh, Pompey came to Damascus, and he was trying to organize the Seleucid Syrian uh, region as a Roman province. So, of course, you know, before um, the Romans intervened, the uh, Jews were under the, um, the, the Seleucid Empire, um, which was Greek. But uh, then the Romans defeated uh, the, uh, uh, the Greek rule. And so now this area of Syria, which, you know, kind of extended and included um, Judea, um, now is a part of this. And so Pompey is coming to uh, make this region or this area a Roman province. So provinces were areas where the people were regarded as subjects rather than allies of Rome. So, you know, some of these people um, sought to be an ally, so they were more kind of independent. But if Rome had decided you're no longer an ally, but now you are a province, you are now um, a part of the Roman Empire, uh, and now you are people who live uh, in that area are subjects to Rome. This does not mean that they are citizens of Rome uh, or that they have Roman citizenship, uh, but now they are subject to Rome's power. So uh, representatives of both Aristobulus II and Hyrcanus II, so these are these two brothers um, of Alexander Janaeus who had been vying for control of the area, both of them had appealed to Pompey to settle who amongst them should rule in Judea. Um, so after threats from extreme supporters of Aristobulus, Pompey uh, had Aristobulus imprisoned, and then he went to lay siege on Jerusalem in 63 BC. Probably, according to uh, many historians, is, is probably on the Day of Atonement is when he took this over. So Hyrcanus, uh, opened the gates of Jerusalem to Pompey, and then, so now that he welcomed them, they didn't try to you know, ward them off, and he was permitted to remain as high priest. So Judea it is now part of the Roman province of Syria. Now, uh, it was important for uh, Rome to have control of this area uh, for several reasons. One, there is to the... Um, more to the east is the threat of the Parthians. Um, and so uh, being able to have some kind of buffer zones with the Parthians, it was important to have, have Palestine. And uh, also to provide this, this area can be a kind of border area between Asia Minor up in the north and Egypt down the south, which Rome as well um, uh, has influence in. So it also has close proximity to the uh, Nabataean kingdom, uh, and that kingdom controlled caravan uh, routes. So Hyrcanus was, was allowed then as high priest to govern uh, Judea, uh, Perea, and Galilee. Uh, Greek cities in the east and west and Samaria were added to the direct administration of the province of Syria. So, Galilee, up in the north, um, is going to be a part of the Syrian province. Uh, and so, but the Hyrcanus is uh, going to have this kind of jurisdiction over the area as part of that province. So just very kind of quickly, a look here at some of the Roman rulers um, uh, in uh, Judea or over Judea. So there were uh, Roman commanders at first. So you have people like Pompey and uh, Julius Caesar. You have people like Cassius, 
Um, and then you have Anthony, and uh, later on you're going to have uh, Agrippa. So you'll see several of these people who are um, these kind of rulers um, for the Romans. Some of them are Romans, uh, but uh, rulers uh, over this area. Now, in the Palestinian rulers uh, for this, well, we'll get Antipater. So this is the the Idumean, uh, the wealthy Idumean who kind of helped brokers things between Hyrcanus and the Romans so that uh, um, Hyrcanus is going to survive. Yeah, he becomes a procurator uh, for the Romans in, uh, in this area. And then uh, we're going to have Hyrcanus II, who's going to kind of rule as an, what they call an ethnarch. So a ruler of the peoples. Uh, then you're going to have uh, Antipater's two sons, uh, Fasil and Herod. So Herod the Great is the son of this Antipater who helped to broker this, this deal. And that's how Herod is going to come into uh, political influence. We're going to talk a little bit more here about Herod the Great because he's a significant ruler uh, in Judea. Uh, then we have uh, someone named Antigonus, uh, who tries for a short time to reign and to reign as king. Um, and then we're going to have Herod the uh, First, who is going to get to be called king. So the I have kings here in quotation marks because, um, you know, as a ruler you didn't get to automatically wear the name king, and in fact the Romans don't like. Um, to have rulers who are called kings. But Herod appealed to the Romans to allow him to wear that name because that name uh, legitimized his authority in the region. The, the, the su subjects in that area could better understand his power and authority if he is called a king. But really, he's a king who's a part of a province uh, that is subject to the Romans, so not the term king might suggest someone who's quite independent, but Herod is not really uh, independent. He serves Rome. Uh, this was recently shared with me. It's really quite fascinating. Um, they have taken uh, marble statues of of Roman Caesars uh, throughout many many years. But I just kind of highlighted uh, some of those that are kind of closer to the time of the uh, New Testament. And uh, they've taken marble statues and then they've kind of digitized what these faces would look like, kind of coloring of them. Uh, and it's kind of interesting. It brings to life the images of the uh, Roman rulers. So you can begin there. We have Augustus. Uh, so this is Octavian. Um, who becomes really the first emperor. And then we have Tiberius, who is kind of ruling uh, during the time uh, of Jesus. Then you have the, the what well, some people refer to as kind of the mad emperor, uh, the crazy emperor, Caliglia. Um, and then you're going to have uh, Claudius, uh, who becomes emperor kind of, you know, by an accident. He really wasn't much of a threat after Caliglia was assassinated. Uh, they started assassinating all of his family members, but uh, Claudius, as a young man, was uh, hiding. A uh, younger man was hiding. Um, he had a speech impediment, and um, the soldiers, so the story goes, um, decided to give their allegiance to, to Claudius. And so he ends up becoming uh, the emperor, and he's emperor during this time that Paul, uh, the apostle, was carrying out his, his ministry. Then we have Nero, and of course there's a lot of uh, familiarity between Christians and Nero and uh, what happens um, possibly with Christians during the time that Nero reigned when, when the city of Rome was burning. Um, so then you have some, uh, uh, there was a short period of time when there were several different people who tried to run the Roman Empire, but only for a very short time. So Galba, Otho, and Vitellius just had, you know, very brief uh, ten years until they were ousted. Then comes along Vespasian. Uh, so Vespasian is one of the governors, uh, one of the uh, commanders who uh, ends up attacking uh, 
Jerusalem until he is called away from the siege of Jerusalem and uh, becomes emperor. And then um, what who he leaves to carry to finish the uh, downfall of Jerusalem, destroy the city, uh, will be Titus. So that's the first face then on the next one. Then we have uh, Domitian, and Domitian is the ruler at the time when the book of Revelation is, is uh, written. And so some real serious persecution at a kind of more empire level takes place during the time of Domitian. There are very sporadic problems that Christians have uh, with the Romans directly uh, up until the time of Domitian. Yes, there is a little bit of time during Nero. Of course, church tradition um, um, uh, teaches that both Peter and Paul were executed when Nero um, was, was emperor. So there, there were some, uh, you know, encounters, but uh, n nothing really extensive. So it's too, the, the Christian movement is kind of too small, too curious for most emperors to be um, terribly uh, bothered by them. So um, then the, the rest of them from uh, Nerva and Trajan and Hadrian uh, through, through throughout the rest of there are not nearly as significant for the kind of the beginning of early Christianity, but certainly play a role uh, as Christianity is going to continue on uh, developing. So I'll just stop with uh, focus there on Domitian. All right, we do want to talk here about uh, Herod the Great because uh, he is um, the uh, Roman ruler uh, in Judea over, over Jews. And so a little bit just about uh, who Herod was, how he came to power, and, and um, a, a brief sketch of his time. So he became governor of Galilee when he was uh, 25 years old, and he held that position for 10 years. Um, he was very uh, competent, uh, competent at collecting taxes, and he was very good as well at suppressing a revolt. Uh, in 40 BC, he was unsuccessful at protecting uh, Judea from these Parthians uh, and from this person who rose to, you know, describe himself as kind of king, Antigonus. So uh, those were um, um, a downfall for him for that time in 40. But in 37 BC, um, you know, he was able to fight back the Parthians and fight back Antigonus. And then he is proclaimed as king of Judea by Anthony uh, Octavian, who, that is uh, Augustus, um, and, the Roman Senate, and the Roman Senate. So, um, so that's a, a big deal uh, to be called uh, king. He then uh, goes back to recapture Galilee and Jerusalem from the Parthians after being made king. Uh, and so uh, that's his bit of a um, success then for him. Uh, prior to recapturing Jerusalem, uh, he ends up marrying uh, Merimi the first. This is this uh, Antigonus's niece. So Antigonus is a member of the Hasmonean family, the, the Maccabeans family. So by marrying Merimi the first, so this wasn't Herod's first wife, uh, but by marrying Merimi, um, he ends up trying to legitimize his rule by having a Jewish princess, basically, um, as his wife. And so his, chil his children um, would be, you know, the uh, children of a Jewish princess. And so that might give them more legitimacy as, as well. But that's not going to work out very well for Merimi or, or her, her sons. Uh, so there are really uh, three periods of Herod's reign uh, as king. And so uh, the uh, first period is really a kind of a period of consolidation. And it's during this period that he was opposed by Pharisees uh, because he's an Idumean. He's not really a Jew, although Idumea had been taken, the area had been taken over by the Hasmoneans and people were forced you know, to be uh, circumcised, to be converts to, to Judaism. You know, he doesn't come from, you know, Jewish stock. And um, he's also opposed by members of the aristocracy uh, because he was not a Hasmonean. So the Pharisees don't really care too much about 
him not being a Hasmonean because the they the Pharisees did well under um, Alexander Salome, who was a Hasmonean queen, but generally they did not do well with the Hasmoneans. So, uh, but the aristocracy did align with the Hasmoneans, and they didn't like the fact that um, Herod the Great was ruling over them, and, and he wasn't a part of this, this family. Uh, then there is a period, of course, during the time of consolidation, he, he ends up killing uh, Pharisees, and he kills members of the aristocracy. And another thing that's really quite interesting about killing the aristocracy is the aristocracies have land, and when he kills them, he takes over their land, and then what Herod does is he sells out that land to investors, and sometimes these investors are non-Jews, so non-Jews are able to start buying up land in the region uh, because Herod wants friends, allies, and so this brings in this influence of non-Jews who possess land, but of course, these non-Jews don't really know how to farm the land. Um, other people know know the land and what works, and so they end up having to hire people, hire Jews who will work this land uh, for them as they are growing crops that are going to be beneficial for the Roman economy. So uh, what we then see is uh, Herod is really building this uh, uh, his kingdom. It, Herod is a great builder. He builds a number of things to show uh, the dominance of the region. He builds gymnasiums. He, he builds uh, amphitheaters, hippodromes. And, of course, one of the biggest things that Herod the Great did was he enlarged the size of the, of the temple. So the temple is, you know, he wanted to make it a, a marvel, not because he was necessarily that religious of a person, although he did... Uh, abide by Jewish law, even when he was traveling. Um, he wanted um, the temple to be a place that would attract Jews who are out in the diaspora, who would come and who would spend money. Uh, and so he made this uh, temple. The architecture as well is influenced by you know, Greek, uh, Greek styles. Uh, he has porticos that are in there in these giant courtyards. And so uh, that is a, a major thing, and probably as well it wins favor amongst the priesthood and probably amongst aristocracies as well. So um, this is a time of great prosperity during uh, Herod the Great's reign. But then uh, from about 14 BC to about 4 BC, when, or about that time is when Herod the Great dies, there is this period of domestic uh, trouble, um, so he'll, he'll end up killing uh, his wife, Merami, and ends up killing uh, their, their two sons because of, uh, he heard that they were threatening to take over his kingdom. So, um, so it is just a, a time when it's a very dangerous to be close to Herod because he becomes quite suspicious. And it would be during this time, the last part of this, that the account for in Matthew's gospel of Jesus' birth, so he's born during this particular time of domestic trouble for Herod the Great. And so the story about Herod, uh, you know, hearing about a possible child who was born, who was supposed to be the king, and then wanting to kill them. I mean, it fits a, a general character about Herod the Great and about uh, his violence uh, towards any threats to him uh, during this time. So that's a brief little uh, introduction to uh, a little bit about Rome, how Roman rule came about. Uh, who some of the Roman rulers were, and uh, particularly the, the key one of uh, Herod the Great. And we're going to talk more about kind of life uh, during this uh, period of time uh, in a future uh, podcast.